Okay. Welcome to our ESRP webinar for today. We will get started in just a minute. Just seeing folks trickle in, this is great. All right, well, we'll just go ahead and get, get started here. Uh, my name is Tish conway Cranis, and I'm the Science Manager for the Estuarian Salmon Restoration Program. And I'm here with Jay Kreenitz, the ESRP Program Manager, and Kay Caramile, our RCO Grant Manager, and Darren Williams, who is our ESRP uh, Admin assistant. And we are just delighted to be here with Peter Bales today of Northwest Watershed Institute, who will tell us about some restoration at um, Tarbu de Bob Bay. So um, before I give the uh, the screen to Peter, um, just a, a quick um, introduction. So um, WDFW's Estuary and Salmon Restoration Program is founded on the scientific principles of the Puget Sound Nearshore Ecosystem Restoration Project, or PISNRP. And with that, 90% um, of our funding goes to funding process-based restoration in the Puget Sound near shore. And the other 10% goes to research projects that inform restoration. Unlike many of the webinars that we uh, pr present, um, today's webinar is, is actually about a restoration project and, uh, and learning something um, about that. And uh, we see this as sort of part of our broader objective of um, ecosystem response tools. So learning and then communicating, reassessing and implementing into the restoration work we do. Um, so uh, I'm really excited to introduce Peter. Um, he is the co-founder of the Northwest Watershed Institute and the director of the Northwest Watershed Institute, um, it, which is a science-based conservation organiz organization that is focused for 20 years on a landscape scale protection and restoration effort for the Tarbu Creek Deba Bay watershed on the Olympic Peninsula, which is, I will say, an amazing place to go if you ever get a chance. Um, he completed an MS in fishery science uh, and aquatic ecology from Oregon State University and a BS in biology from Middlebury College. So welcome, Peter, thank you so much. And I will um, pass the reins to him. Thank you. See if I can do this. Um, hey, thank you. Uh, can you guys see this messy screen here? Okay. I'm in a um, start with a little video of the project just to give you an overview of what it's about and then we'll go into the, the main project.
Okay. Um, let's see what we got here. Uh, thank you, Stan. So that video was made possible by Russ McMillan here, who's one of uh, the main people getting credit on this project, I hope. Uh, he did all our video drone photography work and for the monitoring I'm gonna talk about. Um, also, Michelle Zuckerberg, uh, who is a natural resource, uh, natural areas manager for Washington Department of Natural Resources. And uh, do, she was really instrumental in the first part of this project. Uh, she managed the removal of the houses and infrastructure. And then Northwest Watershed Institute um, uh, was responsible for the rest of the restoration. Uh, hey, with Peter, the grant. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I just want to make sure that you know that we are seeing a, a blank screen. Oh, no. You it's guys okay. Don't see it? Yeah. Uh, that's weird. I know the best laid plans. Um, uh, to me, it looks like what happens at the very end of a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to try stop share and try screen share again. How's that? Okay. Yep. Okay. That looks great. How's that? Good. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So here's the title page uh, with myself presenting and Michelle and uh, Russ also co-authors. And um, we had a design team um, of myself as the fish biologist, kind of aquatic person, Jim Johannesson uh, for the coastal beach part of it, and Tom Smeda, the engineer for the more stream side of things, and Kathy Smeda um, helped with the vegetation plans. And then Jonathan Wagner also with coastal um, geologic on the coastal part of it. Um, one of the neat things about this project was we had a design review team um, that basically came out and gave us some advice early on in the project. And uh, that was Paul Bakke, who's now retired from US Fish and Wildlife Service at um, Fluvial Geomorphologist. Hugh Shipman uh, was with Ecology and then George Pess and um, fish biologist with NOAA, and then Dave Wilderman, who's a natural area program uh, a biologist with DNR. And then our labor was uh, Pilchuck excavating, the NWI field crew, and Nickel Brothers removed the house for DNR. Let's see here. So this project is part of a much larger effort to uh, kind of a landscape scale conservation effort to protect and restore Daybob Bay. Uh, natural, and that natural area was expanded in 2016 over to include Thorndike Bay. You can see the addition there. And uh, Devil's Lake is also technically a part of um, Daybob Bay. The pink dot is the project site location. And this is just one of the least developed uh, high quality salt marsh embayments remaining in Puget Sound, just a beautiful spot. A lot of it was undeveloped because of the steep slopes. Um, and these salt marshes have a global, two globally rare plant associations um, that DNR identified. And the, where the original spot for the Daybob Bay natural area it was a couple hundred acres. And over the past 10 years, um, uh, a whole coalition of people have managed to uh, persuade DNR to expand that boundary um, to more protect the ecosystem, the estuarine ecosystem there. So um, it's about 10,000 acres right now. Um, pictured here are representatives from the Skokomish tribe, um, Jefferson Land Trust, DNR, um, and our legislators, I can see Kevin Vanderweg there and one of our county commissioners. So this is way back, but there's been a lot of support over the years for Daybob Bay 
uh, natural area protection and restoration. And it also includes the upstream watershed uh, of Tarboo Creek. You can see here on the left, um, this is Northwest Watershed Institute's Tarboo Wildlife Preserve of about 500 acres uh, in the heart of the Tarboo Valley. And then the land trust, uh, we worked with the land trust and landowners to get conservation easements on a number of properties. So we're trying to protect the stream corridor of Tarboo Creek all the way down to Daybob Bay. Tarboo Creek is the largest freshwater source to this Tarboo Daybob Bay area. So it's important to keep it um, clean and protected. The green areas on the map are the uh, protected lands. The purple line is the Daybob Bay natural area. So within that boundary, DNR is looking for grant funding to work with willing landowners to uh, purchase lands as part of the natural area. And also taking state uh, timber lands and um, transferring those into natural area protection. So this project uh, is pretty much surrounded by protected lands. Um, the phase two you see there is um, still in private ownership, but it's one that we are working on a uh, uh, possible acquisition with the landowner. Um, the part in pink is the subject of this restoration, and it was purchased by DNR about 2014 or 15. And this, this is the watershed boundary for Anderson Creek that flows into Daybob Bay on the west side of the bay. And um, this is a, just maybe a year before 2000, yeah, probably 2015. You can see some of the houses have been removed and um, garages. There's a big main house here, another second house here. There was a garage here, another garage here, and then a boat house and boat ramp here. About 400 feet of rock bulkhead and an access road. Um, one of the great things about this project, um, it was the restoration was funded primarily by ESRP. Thank you very much. Um, but that it allowed us, but the DNR acquisition with um, other funding allowed us to do more of a full restoration, and there were very few constraints. Um, to human human constraints, the restoration. Um, one of which was this road. We had to leave the road in because the upstream landowner has a legal right to uh, use this road. So other than that, we were able, we were able to uh, work on the whole project, restore, remove the bulkhead, remove all the all the concrete, all the infrastructure. You saw that? Oops, sorry. Okay, so one of the interesting things was the mouth of this little Anderson Creek. This is on the other side of the bay. This is Discovery Creek. And the creek actually comes down on the right-hand side. And, um, and then the longshore drift of sediment pushes the creek to the north behind the sand burn. And in certain years, um, historically, this creek went more than a half mile all the way up the beach around the bend over here and um so it's at one point uh wfw did some uh, fish surveys in here and just loaded with fish um just really nice productive habitat for juvenile uh juvenile chum um coho um cutthroat trout and so we were thinking a similar thing was going to happen at um, Anderson Cr Creek, but you can see what it looked like when we got there, uh, straight out to the beach with a big rock bulkhead protecting it. Um, not quite sure how much longshore drift sediment was available to move the creek behind a berm, but this is kind of a photo of uh, historically, I think the photo on the left is about 1970 something, and you can see the creek's pretty much where it is now. I mean, where it was in 2015, coming down through and out to the beach. But if you look over on the right side, um, if you see my cursor, that's the stream coming down the valley. It kind of wiggles around and then pushes up to the north um, behind what appears to be this coastal berm. So we're thinking the same kind of thing is going to happen. We're not really sure. 
And um, it has a lot of relevance to the design because we've got this road here coming out to the beach and we don't want the creek to blow out so far north that's gonna block the road um, and cause problems for access for the adjoining landowner. Um, so part of the design was to move the creek further to the south and move the road further to the north. And Jim Johansson and I had a bet about how long it would take the creek to move up and get all the way to the road. Another thing we looked at was reference uh, streams and beaches in the nearby area, similar areas. We looked all over with our design team, um, went around to different small streams and beaches. And you can see some interesting stuff here, the way these cedars are right along the shoreline at low bank shoreline, that's pretty cool. And we'd like to see that happening. Um, and then uh, all the driftwood and just forest right up to the bank. And we kind of chose that as our alternative here. And here's one of the designs, you can see the edge of forest right pretty much at high tide. And the first step was removing all the rock. And here's the beach after uh, rock was removed, slopes were brought back. I think this was just uh, shortly after the restoration in 2016. Uh, and here's a picture of the overall thing. You can see about a year later, you can see the um, creek is already moving to the north behind this little berm that's forming here. We didn't do this, it just happened very quickly. Uh, road has moved more to the north. Uh, creek has meandered through the valley here. Um, it's great to see this creek as it's, it makes a little um, slough area behind here. And on a couple of occasions, we have seen juvenile chum using these, these areas. Um, another thing we looked at was um, wood on the beach. Um, historically, there ha well, there hasn't been a whole lot of work on this, uh, but it seems to me that these beaches had a ton more wood on them um, on Hood Canal. Most of this wood is quickly removed so that people can, uh, shellfish growers and others can drive on the beach or for firewood or whatever. Um, so here's an ex a rare example of some uh, fallen trees. Um, here's another example from a landslide where wood came down in a landslide from about 10 years ago. It's still on the beach. Um, this is a uh, great habitat, especially for things like plain fed midshipmen, which nest underneath the structure. You can see their eggs on the top of this um, uh, piece of wood. And there's a midshipman right there. And of course, other uh, intertidal species like herring spawning areas and things. So we tried a little experiment of uh, um, placing some. Um, water, these are horse chestnut trees that had to be removed anyway from the site. Um, and we uh, put a dead man down about six feet, not a real dead man, but a log. And uh, here's what it looked like right after we put it in. And it's still there um, from 2016 and it looks great. And uh, I'd love to do some monitoring of structures like this to see what sort of cutthroat use there is and other, other juvenile chum salmon. Hood Canal has the threatened uh, summer chum juveniles that spread out along the beaches of Hood Canal and to see if they're using these kind of structures. Another thing we did that uh, I would highly recommend for projects like this is um, we put in about four inches of hog fuel chip uh, mulch. And we get this in 50 yard trucks and hauled in, dumped, and then spread with the excavator about four inches thick. And this just provides an amazing uh, base for, for successful planting and um, holds, in the, holds in the moisture and uh, starts the mycorrhizal fun, fun, fungi going the trees need and also um, keeps a lot of the weeds down. And these low coastal sites I was just notorious for getting weeds from every direction. So that brings up the crew. The crew not only planted, but um, we did uh, maintenance on the site. And I'm really thankful that ESRP funded um, us to continue to do stewardship maintenance for 
um, I think it was a total of four years as a second small um, grant because that was really critical to keep the weeds down the first couple of years and do supplemental plantings and monitoring. So um, one of the monitoring we did was the aerial photo. Uh, two types, these oblique aerial photos from a drone, which I just love these things. They're just great for um, describing the project. And also, of course, you saw the video, um, but here's an, another photo. And these were really useful for um, presentations, but also just getting an idea of what the site looks like over time. Well, another thing we used was the um, uh, the ortho photos um, that are very high resolution. You can zoom in on this and practically see a coffee cup on the table. So it was really helpful for just kind of getting an idea of where we were missing things over time and what's going on with the stream and just kind of a photo documentation of the site. Um, you can see in this area here where it's all brown chip mulch. That, one, that was an area that got spread too heavily with mulch. It was like a foot and a half thick. <laughs> and uh, most of our trees didn't do well. So it was a site of a supplemental planting. Now the trees are doing fine. So things continue to change out there. Um, here is a beaver pond that we just discovered about two weeks ago. Um, a new, fresh new beaver pond that formed at the mouth of the creek as really delightful because you wouldn't think about a beaver. This is an independent tributary of, of, of Hood Canal. There's, it's not part of a larger system really. The beavers had to get here from somewhere. They probably swam through the salt water and um, came up, found all this willow and all this young planting. So um, uh, they managed to get in here somehow and they've made this beautiful pond, which is now filled with uh, um, tree frogs that were going crazy. And also uh, the creek right downstream, um, we saw the, the juvenile chum salmon in a little slough area down through there. But this is um, surely a good habitat for uh, cutthroat trout and um, possibly uh, some a few coho that use this stream. And we did not see a humpback uh, recently, but this shot is from 2012, just about an eighth of a mile away from the Anderson Creek site. So, and that's all I have for now. Great, thanks, Peter. Uh, this is a great story. Um, I have a one question from Kathleen about a fact sheet or website, and I was about to stick the link to the monitoring report in the chat, which I can do. Um, is there anything else that any other resources about this project that we could point her to? Um, that's about it. The stewardship plan and the monitoring report mm -hmm. uh, video is on our on our website, uh, nwwatershed.org. Okay that as well. Um, any other questions uh, from Lawrence Reeves? Where did the house get moved to? Oh yeah, I kind of missed that part. Um, so the house was barged off in the middle of the night um, by Nickel Brothers at a high tide in the, in the spring. And um, it got moved up to British Columbia. And that's the last I heard of it. <laughs> so I don't know where it got moved to, but it's an uh, interesting program. DNR handled most of that. Um, the other houses were removed by um, posting, DNR posted a bid and they were re removed through a, by salvagers basically who came in for a fairly low amount and were able to um, salvage the houses and take them out. Okay, awesome. Um, question from Jason, great talk. Do you have any thoughts on connections to the 2009 restored site next door or other restored sites in the vicinity? Um, I 
Well, it's really neat to see the way it's, it's now, the, the site we did in 2009 is looking really, really good. And um, which I'm happy about because we had to remove a bunch of roads on fairly unstable slopes and it's all remained uh, back to kind of original contours and it's remained really stable. Um, but it's neat to see it as part of this larger protection effort in this part of the bay. Really, there's only one inholding left in the Anderson Creek Valley in the watershed, really. The rest of it's protected. So it's just neat to see its way it's, it's developing over time. Yeah, great. Um, uh, this is a question from Mike Connor, who is interested in cost by category. I don't know if you have that in the top of your head uh, or if there's a resource to point uh, to Mike. Um, no, I would say if you're making a budget for something like this, um, make your budget the best you can and then double it and hope that you come out okay at the end. Because uh, we had to, one of the things we had to do, and I didn't have slides about this, I probably should have included it. It's kind of interesting. Um, after we re-meandered the creek in 2016, um, it, we had a huge flood event and it basically blew out. And partly it was the problem with the design that we had. We assumed uh, a small stream wasn't going to have a problem. We could just stick some wood in it and keep a small stream channel. But it was on a 3% slope um, in this valley that's made of um, landslide material. So it's highly erosive soils and a 3% stream gradient is still really steep. That's like, you know, three feet per hundred feet is quite a drop. And so as soon as we had some big flows, it just down cut and we had a little mini Niagara Falls kind of moving upstream. And so 2017, we had to go back in and redo the whole lower half of the stream channel by putting in um, uh, bioengineering, more bioengineered approach with um, um, log controls and um, and bioengineered banks and and it worked out the second time it worked out beautifully and things are are looking really well at this point. Um, the revegetation's gone really bad. I mean, really bad. The the re, really good. The reed canary grass has not been too bad um, in terms of recolonization. There's a little bit along the streams, but we got enough um, native plant material in there that's kind of shading it out and keeping it under control for the most part. Um, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, a uh, question from Josh, how, let's see. Um, Josh, I'm not, I'm not, I think I'm missing some words in the question. Oh yeah, I see it here. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, hog fuel. Um, yeah. We used to do restoration projects with straw and seed. And um, I, I, I hate to do that now if I can avoid it because um, it just brings in all the grass species and some of those grasses are incredibly hard to get away from and they also compete with your, your trees. Um, and you're, you're just battling it the whole rest of the project. So the hog fuel is just great. I would I'd use it almost every project now um, where possible where you can get a, a truck in and our costs are not that high. It's $500 for 50 yards of material delivered. And then um, it's not that big a deal to spread it if you got the uh, an excavator to spread it. So yeah, that's a gr great way to go. I, I really like it. Um, sometimes you might get some weird seed in with the, the chip mulch, but very rarely have we seen that problem. Like it's just basically chewed up trees from the uh, our mill here in Port Angeles. Um, we have another question, but here's a follow-up from Josh about um, how much it delayed the establishment of invasives. Uh, I'd say it delayed it significantly, uh, um, you know, because you've got four inches of bark chip and you're planting into that the following year. So you don't, if you had bare soil or straw, 
you would probably get a lot more grasses coming in right away. Um, and the only, the, the real invasive problems we had because it is like open to all sorts of seed sources um, is morning glory. And um, morning glory was a real problem, but that's, that's better now that the trees are larger. So, yeah. Great. Um, question from Jenna, is there public access to this natural area site? There is by water. Um, there's a, in fact, there's a county park, a water access only county park at that first slide I showed a broad spit where people camp on the spit. But no, there's no access to the site because it's a private uh, beach access road that goes down through the private landowner's property to the DNR property. And only the, only the, the uh, DNR and the, the private landowner have, have access on the property, yeah. Okay, any other questions for Peter? I put the links to the monitoring report, the stewardship plan and um, the website for Northwest Institute, all uh, uh, watershed, sorry, uh, in the um, in the chat. So um, those should all be accessible. And um, yeah, let's just um, thank thank Peter virtually. Thank you so much. Uh, this was really great to hear about, and um, I really appreciate it. Yeah, we do give tours of the property every once in a while. So if you're in the area, mm -hmm. or contact us and um, uh, that's a lot of fun too. So thank you very much. Thank you to ESRP for opportunity to talk about the project and also for the support, the funding support that made the project possible. So thank you. Yeah, take him up on the offer, everyone, <laughs> to go out. It's, it's, a, it's a great place. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, I'm going to end the webinar. All right. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Okay. Enjoy Bye. the beautiful day.